Welcome to Talk Tennis. Today I am joined with Troy and we are hosting Will Bocek from the Tennis Tribe. That's very exciting. I love the name. Uh, Will, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me and uh, thanks for um, asking about my name uh, before the show. Most <laughs> people get that wrong. <laughs> Didn't want to butcher it even though I can't make any promises. <laughs> Um, I think we're super excited because today we're going to focus on doubles, yeah. which, yeah. Will, I know you just started this like brand new campaign. I think you launched mm -hmm. it at BMP. Um, Troy, I know you love watching doubles. I'm a big fan of doubles. So, um, Will, why don't you just give us a little bit more background information on you and your website and what you're doing and even a shout out to your podcast and then we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've played. I grew up playing tennis, uh, kind of off and on um, throughout the years. I played at a small Division three school. Uh, after college, I took some time off, and then when I moved to Texas, which was like six years ago, uh, I used tennis just to meet people because I moved to a new city. I didn't know anybody, so I started playing some USTA leagues and tournaments, and eventually, I started just playing a lot more doubles naturally. So. Uh, I got good at building websites and I started a doubles blog and I started writing about it every Thursday, which turned into this strategy newsletter that I still do every Thursday. Uh, and some people who I was playing with around Texas were like, hey, we love your content. Like we love your doubles blog. So like I would do all these like counterintuitive lessons, like um, it's good to get beat down the line, right? If you're not mm -hmm. getting beaten down the line three times per match, then you're probably not moving enough at the net. So a lot of things like that. Um, and I got really good feedback, so I just kept it going, kept it going. Um, and then that's turned into uh, starting to review tennis gear, which is how I um, developed my partnership with Tennis Warehouse. Uh, it's developed into a podcast, which I've uh, been doing for about a year and a half now. Uh, and I'm still doing um, a lot of uh, double strategy work, uh, including some with uh, pro doubles players now as well. So. Um, it's been a uh, it's been a fun ride um, in the last few years. I've been a lot of fun working with like kind of higher and higher level uh, players. Um, so uh, this past October, I went to Indian Wells. So, you know, they moved it in 2021 because of COVID. Uh, and when I was there, I was just kind of absorbing everything. I was watching the fans, watching the players. Uh, and I noticed um, the crowds were definitely down, uh, but the doubles crowds were really, really good there. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why aren't people watching more doubles on TV? Like, this doesn't make sense to me. So I reached out to Gabby Dabrowski, who I had had on my podcast about a year earlier, and said, hey, what if we do these t-shirts and do a Watch More Doubles campaign and launch it at Indian Wells? And she loved it. She was like, I'm in. Let me know what you need from me. I'm going to get all these players on board. Um, so it took several months. I designed the t-shirts, uh, got them printed, shipped them to her. Uh, she got 14 other WTA doubles players on board. Nice. And we all wore them at Indian Wells, promoted them on social media. Uh, and we're trying to keep it going um, so that, you know, Tennis Channel hopefully picks it up and uh, doubles can get more airtime and, and all that stuff. Because it, uh, to me, it just, it, it started with, it doesn't make sense to me that everybody plays doubles but everybody watches singles. And that's kind of how um, the Watch More Doubles campaign was born. Nice. That's awesome. And Troy, I know you're at BMP. He was there in October and he was also there just recently a couple weeks ago. And mm -hmm. I know he's like the one that will find like the best match out of like all the matches going on and like just sit yeah. there and like hone in. So tell me a little bit about your experience watching doubles and some of your reasons why you love doubles too. Yeah, I, I usually, uh, when I have a chance... Don't get a whole lot of time to watch, you know, mini matches while we're working there. But like if I have a lunch break or some time where I can just go watch tennis, it's kind of funny because I'll tell, you know, people that are like going to Indian Wells with us for the first time, you know, I might get offered, you know, tickets to go to Stadium One and watch. I think one time I skipped on like a Nadal versus somebody else, but they were like really <laughs> high seats, like, you know, in the stadium. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm really like a, I call myself a seat snob, like when it comes to the stadium. So like. <laughs> I want to be baseline, like right behind the, the baseline Me of the too. court, you know, as, cl <laughs> as close as possible. Cause that's where you can really like feel the action, hear everything. You can see the shape of the ball, but right. I, I much prefer going to like stadium six at mm -hmm. Indian Wells 
and watching, you know, a WTA doubles match baseline and like really getting in the action than sitting, you know, at a premiere match on Stadium One where I'm like high up and <laughs> I'd rather just watch it on HD TV <laughs> instead of that, you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, like this year I just randomly was watching, I think, uh, Caroline Dolhide and Storm Sanders. And nice. they, I forget, I think they mm -hmm. played the girls that ended up winning the tournament or making it to yeah, the finals. Yeah, I was at that match, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I was yeah. wondering that if you guys had That match was crazy. <laughs> that match was crazy. <laughs> yeah, but then, like, a years past, like, I was baseline watching uh, Shea Shui and uh, Barbora Streetskova versus, I think it was, like, a quarterfinal match. I forget who it was against. But, yeah, I really liked that action, that up-close Doubles mm -hmm. is such a great thing to watch. It's quick exchanges. It's intense. And you can really just – you just get the most bang for your buck. So I definitely am a big nerd fan when it comes to, like, watching close-up doubles. Well, and I think this is where our worlds combine, too, is because we've got the gear knowledge on our end and you've got the analysis knowledge on your end. And we're all tennis players, so we've all spent a lot of time playing doubles. And through we've got some sponsored players out there. And through our team, T-Dub, we've somehow gotten this little group of ladies who are all double specialists. And I think that has allowed me to even lean in even further to watch these doubles matches and keep up with what's going on and seeing even like the partnerships change and that dynamics. And then even we can talk a little bit about like prize money and doubles versus singles versus big tournaments and little tournaments and all that, which it just makes it so interesting to be a fan of women's doubles and men's doubles, uh, to be completely honest. Yeah. The doubles players, um, that, uh, yeah, that Tennis Warehouse has. I'm excited to talk about some of them because you all have some really uh, excellent doubles specialists, including mixed doubles specialists. Right? Okay, let's just jump <laughs> right into it. And a lot of these players also had a lot of success at the college level. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. we are seeing a positive transition from college to pro. And these mm -hmm. players are right in there. I, I'm not even sure where to start. Um, I know where to start. Okay, Troy. She's a <laughs> California girl. She's amazing at doubles, mixed doubles, played at Arizona State. She's a lefty. Like Baby bullet. Baby but, bullet. Yeah, yes. Desiree Kraftcheck is pretty fun to watch. She is fun to watch. And Des and I go way, way, way back. So I've always been a fan, but I've known her since she was about 14, a freshman in high school. And I've been able to keep up with her. And now she's part of Team Teed Up. So yeah, yeah let's start. You let's, coached her. I, I <laughs> she came and played for me at Palm Desert High. Shout out CIF champions in what, 2011? Undefeated. Let's go. <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about her game and her gear and what makes her such a successful doubles player. So, Will, you want to start out with her game? Sure. Um, yeah, so obviously the biggest thing with her is, is she's a lefty. Yes. Uh, so that automatically gives you um, kind of a, a strategic advantage because, uh, you know, anytime you have something about your game that people don't see that often, uh, it's going to give you kind of a leg up and, and being left-handed does that. So she's got the lefty serve in the ad court that that most lefty players have. Um, she's great at mixed, won three uh, mixed grand slams last year uh, with two different partners. And uh, she's really got a, an all-court game. Um, she can hit from the baseline. She gets to the net. Uh, she has excellent lobs, um, which is one of the big differences that I've noticed over the last kind of two or three years between the men's and women's game is the women uh, tend to hit the lob a little bit more often uh, and it's a little bit more effective in the women's game. Um, so yeah, overall, uh, really not any weaknesses and really a solid all-court game. Uh, and then she takes advantage of that, uh, that leftiness, if you will. Yeah, and the, Troy, you're a lefty, so you know what that's all about. Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about her gear, and she's recently made a string change. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that, too. Yeah, yeah, so pretty popular racket overall, but mm -hmm. also pretty popular on the doubles tour, um, her Babylon Pure Arrow. Mm -hmm. um, she was, for a while, using a RPM Blast mm -hmm. in the whole racket, so, you know, that's just tons of control. Yeah. Easy spin, but um, I think she was starting to get a little bit of discomfort. Um, probably not the best feel on the arm after a long, yeah. a long, long time of playing with it. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe she recently transitioned over to a hybrid, or is she with the softer? Polymer? I want to say she started with a hybrid, and now she's going full bed Luxlon Element. 
Yes. Okay. Yes. So she tried hybrids. Yeah. She tried experimenting, but now she's just using a softer poly. I in think general, so. Yeah. Which you know, I, I get it because it still maintains a lot of that you know control and spin you would get from an RPM blast, but with a little livelier feel, definitely softer. So mm-hmm. hopefully that'll keep her her left arm you know healthy on the tour so she can keep playing as long as possible but, yeah uh, yeah definitely that racket suits her game pretty well the, you know there's another lefty out there at the top of the ranks on the men's side oh great, yeah great probably one of the greatest of all time oh yeah <laughs> no, so another lefty. i mean it's a good racket and yeah. well and this is kind of a little tidbit um a lot of these doubles players are using stock Rackets and then either customizing so they're all the same spec or customizing so they're the spec that they like. But literally, most of these players are using rackets that you can buy at Tennis Warehouse. They're not some secret sauce behind it or anything. <laughs> so it's like nice to know that, like, someone watching Dez can be like, Oh, I want to try that racket. It might work out for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause there's a Maybe lot of, I can play like Dez. Right. <laughs> for sure. There's a lot of, a lot of pro stock out there for exactly. the, you know, top men singles players. And we talk about it all the time. Mm-hmm. We nerd out about the pro stock. Yeah, and yeah. The message boards, <laughs> but it is pretty surprising to, to find out a lot of these, you know, top ranked doubles players are using something that you could actually buy. Just taking the time to get a match customized. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. And Des also has a great personality. She's very social. I, I've noticed, I know even from at a young age, she always wanted to be like in a team environment. And I think that really adds to her success on the doubles court. She's easy to get along with, but she's also super intense. So definitely helps her be competitive. And it's been fun watching her succeed out there. Yeah, she's actually one of the most requested uh, guests for my podcast. I have people reach out all the time. Why don't you have Des on? Why don't you have Des on? Yes. So. If she's listening, does we need to make it happen? <laughs> yeah. We'll we'll get her. We'll get her. Baby awesome. bullet. We'll get her. <laughs> Let's talk about another doubles player. She has not competed yet this year, but she's definitely uh, had an amazing 2021. Won a medal from the Olympics, and she is working her way back. She will be back, you guys, and I think it's just a couple weeks. But Luisa Stefani, if anyone has ever watched her play doubles, you know how like fast she is, how flawless she is, her hands. She's Brazilian. She's just like all around. I have nothing but good things to say. Will, tell me about your opinion of Luisa. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate that she got hurt because her and Gabby Dabrowski were playing so good. Yeah. Um, I think, was it in Cincinnati or the U.S. Open when she got hurt? It I was think? U.S. Um, Open. I think it was against was US Open. Coco McNally, right? I'm pretty okay. sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was last fall, and um, yeah, they were playing so good. I think they had just won uh, either in Canada or Cincinnati, and they made the finals of the other one. And um, yeah, so she is one of uh, one of the only players on the WTA tour that I'm aware of that serves in volleys most of the time. Um, I think she does it almost every time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she's really fun to watch, and um, yeah, has great hands. Um, obviously loves to get to the net uh, and just applies pressure to the opponent. So um, you're really, you know, when you're playing against her, you're on defense. Um, And even on the return, you know, she's always looking to get forward. So she has uh, more of an offensive game style. And if you can defend well enough, um, you can beat her, but uh, it's tough. It's, It's definitely really tough. Yeah. Troy, talk to me about her gear. Yeah. I mean, going hand in hand, Kind of with the, her style, you know, serve and volley, get to the net. She has a really smooth game, mm-hmm. I'd say. You know, whether it's her net game or even her baseline game is really smooth. Everything about it's really nice. She uses a Radical MP, mm-hmm. so the twenty, I believe it's a twenty twenty one, the current one. Um, and compared to something like a Pure Arrow or what you see a lot on the the doubles tour, a little more power. This offers a little more control and feel. So. Um, gives her a lot of, you know, probably control, touch when she comes to the net, but, you know, still um, a decent amount of pop and in, in from the baseline and whatnot. It's got the 16-19 uh, pattern, yeah. easy spin. So it's a, it's a very versatile racket. Um, I know playtester Chris Edwards, that's one of his favorites um, out of all the rackets. So it's a really nice one. And then I think she pairs it up with uh, Hyper G. Yes, yeah. I was going to say. And she strings with one of our favorite strings. Yeah. So... <laughs> 
good control. Yeah. But yeah, still, yeah. she enhances feels the evolved. spin of that racket, gives her a ton of control. Um, you know, and I think it's a it's a pretty good filling poly. We all really like it. Um, so yeah, I think that setup's pretty pretty nice for what she's the way she's playing. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, Will, too, what do you suggest to someone out there that's listening and maybe they want to improve their doubles and maybe they just want to start watching more pro doubles? What kind of ways can they absorb information and knowledge from watching these players and then turn it into their game? Yeah. So so when you're watching the the pros, it's it, it can be intimidating at first, obviously, because they're just so much better at everything than than we are. True. <laughs> but uh, but all of the same principles apply. So when you watch them poaching at the net, taking over the middle of the court, uh, you'll notice most of them hit their, if they have a short approach shot, rather than going for the all-out winner, a lot of times they'll hit it deep down the middle of the court to the person on the baseline and just come in behind it. So all of these um, these same principles and these same strategies apply to our level except we just execute it a lot more slowly. We're, we can't hit the ball as hard. We can't hit with as much spin. We're not as fast. Um, but all the same stuff applies, you know. Um, so we don't want to be trying to hit winners from the baseline. We want to be uh, moving forward or at least setting our partner up at the net. Nice. Um, earlier I talked about uh, one of the differences between WTA and ATP is that the, the lob is a lot more effective. Uh, another big difference is that on the men's side, at least when you get to double specialists, they'll typically both get to the net no matter what. Mm -hmm. So they're going to serve in volley or they're going to return, if not return in volley, return plus one, then volley after that. Whereas on the women's side, you see a lot more one up, one back. So um, Krachikova and Siniakova, the top team in the world, um, they love when Siniakova is up at the net in the ad court and Krachikova is back in the deuce court rallying. Uh, Shea Sue and Elise Mertens last year uh, were one of the best teams and, and Shea would be up at the net. Mertens would be back. So for most club level players, uh, to be honest, the WTA uh, offers a little bit more in terms of learning from because of, they play a little more one up one back. And that's what most people at the club level do. Um, so really focusing on uh, that, I think, would be the best place to start. Nice. Um, we can talk about those number one ladies that you were just mentioning. I'm not even going to try to butcher their names, <laughs> but I know. <laughs> I, say it, I say it different every time. I say Siniakova, Siniakova, <laughs> Krechikova, Krechikova. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I just like look to Troy for all the pronunciation because I always butcher like most <laughs> names. And then he's got it like perfectly. Like I feel like he's studied the WTA pronunciation. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, the same. Like I'll say it a couple different ways. I'll hear an announcer say, it, and then yeah. I'll try and copy that. Then I'll hear an announcer <laughs> say it the other way. Like, okay, this is the right. way to say right. it. Right. I try. <laughs> um, do you want to talk a little bit about their gear, the number one team? Yeah, Nikola yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, Krejcikova. Yeah. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like she's like one of the most overlooked players. 100%. I mean, number one in doubles. What is she like? Number three in singles yeah. or top five yeah. for sure. I think she's been yeah. one and two at one point. But uh, mm -hmm. I love her game. I love her. I mean, her baseline strokes, just long and loopy, nice, clean two-hander. Um, she uses a head extreme. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, talking about pro stocks or whatever, I believe it's kind of like from the mold of one of the older extremes, mm -hmm. which is – if you look at them really closely and you get all into it, uh, it's a little bit more of a rounder head shape versus the current head extreme, which is a little bit more oval. But anyways, she plays extreme and you're talking about how, you know, in the ideal kind of like their team setup with Siniakova, mm -hmm. she's kind of on the uh, from the baseline kind of holding down the ground strokes while Siniakova's um, up at the net Picking and Siniakova off. uses yeah. a... I believe she's still Wilson, mm -hmm. and from what I recall, mm -hmm. um, she was using for the longest time a pro stock of the uh, 6195 mm. or, or a 61 racket, which is kind of my bread and butter, <laughs> yeah. uh, kind of more classic control and feel. So it just kind of goes sense. to show sometimes you see doubles players or singles players, whatever, using a racket, and you're like, oh, that's the perfect racket for them. Uh, in this case, it kind of you know it kind of makes sense, you know, with yeah. Krejcikova being more the baseliner. Right. And uh, Siniakova being more than, you know, the net player, yeah. the feel player. Yeah. Those rackets seem to line up pretty well. Yeah, but. that makes sense. That's cool. 
Um, I was going to talk about another player who I feel like she's kind of transitioned. I think she was really trying to make it in singles, and now she's having a lot of success in doubles. And I feel like she's also just like maturing, and as she matures, her she's just improving all around. But Asia Mohammed, she had such a great start to the year, and she's mm -hmm. continuing to show that she can be a versatile doubles player, play with different different partners so talk to me a little bit about what you think about asia and how her game's kind of like improving and developing and then we'll talk about her gear yeah so she um actually i had her on my podcast last fall during world team tennis and uh i think she won like two or three singles challengers earlier this year down in australia um and she was on like a 24 match win streak or something at some point until the the indian wells doubles final so yeah, so her game translates really well to doubles uh, because part of it is just because she's pretty tall and has uh, a big reach. So when she's in the net, it's just tough to get the ball by her. Um, I was talking about the lob earlier. She has some of the, I think probably the best overheads on the WTA tour. Um, her overheads are awesome. Uh, <laughs> so she's really, really tough to lob. Um, and I actually did a few scouting reports for her and Inna Shibahara uh, at... Um, Indian Wells. Uh, so I worked with them a little bit and, uh, yeah, they're, they're both really smart players in Asia, uh, similar to, um, Louisa Stefani. She likes to get to the net as well. Um, so she, not as much as Louisa, but she will serve in volley some. Um, and if she doesn't do that, you know, she'll, she'll serve, maybe hit a few ground strokes and look to mix it up, either lob down the line or, um, hit something kind of high and loopy and then come in behind it. So, yeah, she's got a, a great kind of all-around game. Um, her her size makes her really tough at the net. Uh, and, um, yeah, we'll see how the singles goes the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. I know she definitely wants to try that just for prize money reasons. But um, at some point, maybe she does transition uh, to to focus on doubles. Which, before we get into her gear, maybe that's a quick chat we can have, too, is uh, I don't think – people that watch tennis realize how hard it is to kind of be a double specialist and still play singles or be just a single, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Because a lot of these girls are qualifying into tournaments with their doubles rankings, but they don't qualify with their singles rankings, but they still want to make it in singles. I know, actually, I think Des was just playing a qualifying tournament. Um, I know before Louisa got hurt, she really wanted to play more singles. Asia, you know, a bunch was, of these. Was Quinn kind of doing that for a while? Yeah. Like singles and doubles. Yeah. And then yeah. It, it's almost like the rankings almost like seem to dictate. And I, we would have to ask them how it works on their end. But any insight on your end, Will, on like how that works? Yeah. So you're talking about a um, an article that I've been wanting to write for yeah. a while. And I'm, I'm going to do it soon. Do uh, it. Yeah, so somebody I had on, on my podcast told me, I think it was Nico Pereira, told me that the split is is around 70-30, so 70% of the prize money to singles and then 30 to doubles. And that 30 is split between partners, right? right. So it's 15% <laughs> to each partner. Um, and then when you look at all the expenses, which I'm still wrapping my head around, uh, yeah, it's wild. Like some of these players you know, our top 50 in the world at what they do. And they're like struggling to make their expenses and they have to like share a coach with other players and all mm -hmm. these things. So um, it is, it's, it's crazy to me, uh, which is, you know, kind of ties into the watch more doubles campaign. Yeah. But yeah, I think balancing it is really tough for them. So, you know, if, if I'm a player and I'm, let's say I'm better than it doubles, but I'm, you know, 200 in singles, I can look at, okay, I can go play this challenger in singles and maybe win, I don't know what the numbers are, maybe like $5,000 if I win it. If I lose in the second round, I, maybe I win like $800. Now, I'm making these numbers up. I don't yeah. know what they are yeah. exactly. But but I can do that or I can enter you know, this 500 event or 1,000 event and play doubles. And I actually have a shot to win the thing, but who knows, like, it's still tough. So maybe I lose first round in that. So how do you balance that? Right. And you can't play both because they're at different locations. Um, so I, I've asked some of the players on my podcast about it and they all kind of handle it differently. And, and you just have to decide like right now, do I feel good enough to, to get out there and really make a push for singles over the next six months? Or 
Um, should I really step back, focus on doubles and, and get as much as I can out of that? Um, and there's no right answer. It's, it's different for everybody. Yeah. And it's tough too, because you really have to be in line with your partner. Cause I've seen players go play singles and then they lose the opportunity to play with their partner. Their partner's obviously going to have to find someone else. And then that partnership's kind of like, Oh, well that one's over. And you kind of miss the chemistry that you might've had. And it's, it's almost yeah. like starting over. So it's, yeah, mm-hmm. it, it can't be easy. I'm sorry. I had to interject there. Um, Asia Mohammed and her gear. Cause I, every time I watch Asia and now that I know exactly what she's playing with, I feel like I know what the ball feels like when she's making contact and it like, it just matches up perfectly. Yeah. So um, we were talking about how she has a great all around game. Mm-hmm. And it works for, it works really well for her doubles game. Um, I would say when, you know, we get questions about rackets just in general mm-hmm. and a customer says, Hey, what's a great all around racket. Mm-hmm. I'd say this one mm-hmm. there. The one that she uses is probably like in the top three of our list. But yeah. It's the E-Zone uh, 100. Yes. Yeah. So definitely. it's just a really popular racket. Yeah. Great feeling racket. Uh, Playtester Brittany, that's been her favorite racket for like the past four generations or something. But uh, it just does everything really well. It kind of has that pure drive type of power, easy power, easy maneuverability. Mm-hmm. But it has really good feel, um, good dampening, comfort on the arm. So it just does everything pretty well. And uh, we really like the current update of the 100. Yeah. Um, some play testers even more than the 98. So mm-hmm. that's a nice racket. Yeah, yeah, for sure. She, yeah, the, that racket suits her really well, I think. She loves your favorite shoes, too. We have to talk oh, about yeah. her shoes. Oh, yeah. she, so she wears the GP Turbo from Nike. And uh, I mean, they're probably the bounciest shoes I've ever worn. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> very, it keeps her Very happy comfortable, yeah. very plush. But they're also very performance oriented. Yeah. You know, they're, they're stable. Um, you know, they don't feel overly heavy, even though they got a, a good amount of weight to them. Yeah, just a really good shoe. I think uh, players that are liking those that have been using them, I mean, Asia, we've had some other players like um, Haley was using them mm-hmm. for a while. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of singles players that are going to be trying to hoard those yeah. shoes up, just like <laughs> a lot of players use older Vapors, you know, yeah. so we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Should we should we transition into some of the men? Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, I just keep bringing up John Isner because yeah. I'm like, he's just going to Because he's a double specialist now. <laughs> he really is. And like, I love that he's playing with different partners. So let's talk about John Isner. Obviously, he's probably got the, big, the biggest serve on the men's tour. So that helps when yeah. you're playing doubles. <laughs> it does. Yeah, so it's funny. At, at the end of Indian Wells, he wins it with uh, Jack Sock. And everybody's like, okay, Jack Sock, like he's been the best player this year in doubles. And they won uh, in Dallas as well, um, Isner and Sock. And then he goes and wins Miami with a different partner, right? with her coach. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, well, maybe Isner's actually good at doubles. Maybe it wasn't all Sock, right? <laughs> so. That's that's so crazy, but yeah, I've been studying this the past like couple of weeks, uh, just as he's had so much success and like what makes him so good at doubles. The obvious things, the serve, right? His serve's huge, yeah. um, so it makes it really easy on his partner at the net. When he's at the net, it's tough to get the ball by him because his wingspan's twelve and a half feet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the other thing that's kind of underrated is. You've seen in singles the past, you know, five, 10 years, a lot of players start to step back on the return, right? So Nadal does it, team has done it, and that doesn't work as well in doubles. So, and the reason for that is just because you have your partner at the net, right? So if they have that much time to poach on the ball and you're stepping that far back, it, it's just not going to work. But Isner doesn't do that. He steps forward and he he just rips the return. And He doesn't make a lot of them. He's not a great returner. But in doubles, you're mostly holding serve anyways. You're holding serve at a higher percentage than you are in singles. So, um, and I want to get some data on this, but my theory is that all he needs is one game where he makes two returns. (laughs) And he's probably going to win both of those points because he's ripping the return. And then they got the break, and then they're not breaking Isner, so the set's over. Right. So... And that's that's my theory on John Isner so far. It may change later. That, that, <laughs> the analogy that I just got in my head was like, so I'm a big football fan. And like, if you have a really good offense, 
you know you're going to be putting up points, so yeah. you're, you're holding serve. You know your offense is doing that. You can just blitz like crazy on defense, and yeah, you're going to give up some touchdowns, but when you make those sacks and you get those stops, well, right. and we know, in, you know? we know that he's right. very comfortable playing tiebreakers, so, yeah, yeah. so he's also good with that. Just send him, man. Just go send for it. it. Just send that return, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I haven't necessarily been able to watch a lot of his doubles, but I, I can imagine it being a little bit more traditional, but I'd like to see him like probably like poach and move more at the net. I think like, I don't know, like I said, I haven't seen um, him play lately, but... I would assume he'd just be like one of those people that could literally stand in the middle of the court and just like bing, bing, bing. <laughs> like, I got it. Um, yeah. yeah. He doesn't have to poach a whole lot because he, he can, even if he takes like half a step to the left, he's covering like, yeah, he's covering so much court that like the, the window, the margin for error on the return is just so much smaller than it is against a player who's even like 6'4", you know, yeah. which is still pretty tall. Right. Um, wow. So he, he really like doesn't have to, and then I I think he lo- I think he did learn a lot from Jack Sock, because you can see like on some of the extended rallies, uh, Isner's gotten smarter uh, as far as doubles goes. He's he's taking less risks, um, he's getting to the net more, um, he's playing the ball kind of through the middle of the court a little bit more. Um, so uh, I do think he learned a lot from Jack as well. Nice. Troy, what's he playing with out there? <laughs> so he's been using that racket for a while now. Yeah. Um, the Prince Beast 100 long body. Mm-hmm. So it's a, uh, you know, kind of a similar racket to the the modern power spin frame, like a pure drive, like a pure arrow, like the E-Zone 100. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, has pretty good comfort, pretty good feel, but does really pack a lot of punch. Mm-hmm. And uh, that one's, was that a 27 and a half or 28? I want to. I think s- it's 27 and a half. Yeah, I think it's 27 and a half. But yeah. I remember it being beefy. And I, I oftentimes would think, like, why would such a tall guy like him need an extended <laughs> length racket? But uh, one thing that I did notice with bigger guys and extended length rackets like him, I know Sangha has used an extended arrow for for quite a while he's not as tall as john but he's a big dude Mm -hmm. um because of the two-handed backhand Mm -hmm. because their hands are so big they take up so much of that Mm -hmm. handle Mm -hmm. that the extended length or the extended uh Mm. handle gives them a little bit more yeah of uh, you know handle to work with like like roddick used to wrap his overgrip all the way up the yoke yeah because he wanted you know just a big handle so i think that has a lot Mm -hmm. to do with it but um yeah, he seems to seems to do pretty well with it. He's been using that style of racket ever since going back to like his college days yeah. where he was like 03 white and then he transitioned I think into the Warrior series mm-hmm. which became the Beast, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah. I think he's pretty comfortable with it. I oftentimes thought in his, you know, the prime of his singles career if I was picking rackets for him, if I was his coach, you know, which he would never listen to me, but I would probably have given him something a little more control oriented. You look at Riley Opelka, he uses more of a, a 95 square inch racket from Wilson, a six one. And he seems to have a little bit, you know, maybe cleaner te- technique on the ground strokes a little bit, or hits kind of uh, feels like he can hit through it a little more. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I feel like from the baseline, John has to hold back a little bit because <laughs> I don't know, maybe it has to do with the power racket. Maybe it's just the, the way he hits it. But I think I would have given him a little bit more control earlier on in his career, but yeah. Hey, you like what you like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that question comes up a lot too. Uh, extended racket for doubles. I certainly think it's a great option because all of us, at least that are not on the pro tour, we're not getting any younger (laughs) i'll take that extra reach a little stability a little more pop like i think it's a great option but that's just me (laughs) i haven't uh, used one myself but i i think that uh i mean i've tested a few out but never like seriously played with an extended racket and yeah i think it does make sense and especially like at the net i'm trying to like just cover so much area um if you're a net player I don't know. Why not take the extended reach? Right. I could like uh, when my partner's serving, maybe use that one. And then the rest of the time on my return games, use the normal one. (laughs) Yeah. And then also one thing, too, and I've been using extended for a little while now, but um, I used to be a big fan of Marty Fish and he uh, he used an extended 6195 for most of his career. And there's one, you know, looking at pictures and watching him hit with it practice. It's kind of weird, but like I actually kind of started doing it too. Is like, say when I'm going for like a first serve and I want the the maximum amount of reach and power, I'll kind of hold the racket normally, like towards the end of the butt cap, mm-hmm. or maybe even hang off 
a little bit of the edge so I'm getting that full length of the racket. Mm -hmm. But maybe when I'm hitting my second serve, I choke up a little bit to get more maneuverability for the spin. And then also Mm -hmm. when you watch someone like Marty Fish or even like Nadal, even though Nadal doesn't use an extended, when you watch them, you see pictures of them when they're volley, they're practicing their volleys, they're choked up on the racket quite a bit. Mm -hmm. You can see like an extra like half inch of the racket. Mm -hmm. Um, sticking Mm. out of the bottom so you know naturally I don't know if they do that or not but like there are certain times where you can use the full length of the extended racket and then as you move towards the net you know just uh, you might naturally just kind of choke up a little bit so it's kind of adaptive a little bit I guess (laughs) interesting (laughs) so many lessons to be learned so many different ways little little nuances I've noticed We could literally talk about doubles players all day, but before we kind of wrap this one up, I'm like, we could just go through. Uh, Let's talk about the Aussies. Uh, We saw at the beginning of the year two Aussies, uh, one coming back from a lot of injuries and one coming back from who knows. I don't, I'm, I can't keep up anymore, (laughs) Um, but Nick Kyrgios and Kokonakis, they uh, started the year off so strong and it looks like they're going to be, I mean, it looks like Nick's playing with uh, Jack this week, actually. Um, looks like they'll be a force to be reckoned with on the doubles court. So maybe give us a little of your insight, Will, on these two fiery Aussie doubles players. So I haven't had a lot of time to analyze them, uh, but I've watched a few of the matches. Nick, uh, obviously, you know, his his serve is similar to John. It's almost unbreakable um, on the doubles court. Uh and he and Jack, I, I think they actually lost in Houston last week. So I, I didn't see, I guess they're teaming up again in uh, Monte Carlo. Is that what you were saying? I think or was so. That for Houston? That maybe it was for Houston. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think, I think they lost in Houston last week. Um, but anyways, uh, yeah, a, a lot of people talk about, you know, when singles players start to play doubles, right? So Nick's, you know, always been a singles player. And like, how does it translate? Um And the advantage singles players have is typically people become double specialists because usually because they couldn't make it in singles, right? Because the prize money is in singles, like we talked about earlier. So uh, whether it's singles or doubles, the most important strokes are going to be the serve and the return. And if you're good at the serve and return, especially it, it seems like more so on the men's side, if you take two top singles players against two top doubles players, the singles players are going to be right there with them just because they're better at that serve and return. But once you get into the rally to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth ball, then the doubles players are going to be a little bit better. Um, so, you know, Nick has a huge serve. They both are singles players, so they're solid returners. They can return either direction. Um, so that's kind of the way I think about um, when I see singles players go in and have success like that. And they're both rocking some Yonex out there, right? They've got the Yonex rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Nick and Tanasi. Tanasi. Uh, both Ezo 98s. I think uh, Kokonakis uses the extended. Yes, I think yeah. you're right. Mm. Which and Nick's sense. always been standard length. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's a great frame as sort of in between the, you know, all-out power of like a pure drive. It kind of has a little bit of that in it, but the 98 head size kind of dials in the control aspect. So it's kind of like, you know, that perfect middle ground between your traditional like classic player's racket, like a prestige or whatnot, and full-on all-out power like a pure drive. Mm-hmm. You know? So I think that's why it's been pretty popular with a, with a lot of pros, whether singles, doubles, yeah. Kyrgios, Naomi, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. makes sense. Do you feel like there's anyone out there that's playing with something that's like very different? It seems like a lot of these doubles players are playing with a great racket that has power and control, a little access to spin. Like, is there anything like, is anyone playing with something super random or different? And you're like, hmm. um, not so much, but I, I would say that just me personally kind of being more of a traditionalist with my rackets. Mm-hmm you know, kind of like in the more classic players rackets. And if I were, if I am using, you know, the more of the modern power racket, I'm going for something like the E-Zone 98 or the mm-hmm. Radical, um, something that, or Blade, something in those lines. I, I'm kind of surprised at how many top doubles players use pure drives, mm-hmm. pure arrows, sort of that really powerful, stiff racket. Mm-hmm. And 
you know, for a while I was just like, oh, why would the, you know, they're really good at touch and feel and doubles, yeah. you know, you really need to hit your targets. And I don't know, maybe you can elaborate more on what your thoughts are of, of it too. But I think a lot of them are, have been playing doubles for so long, the touch and feel so ingrained in mm-hmm. their strokes and themselves mm-hmm. that they like that really easy power. And sometimes a lot of them use really low tensions mm-hmm. because they want that that quick power, especially on the volleys, just in and out, put away mm-hmm. power. And on the serves, they're not so much reliant on, at least the traditional doubles players, not so much reliant on that all out baseline game. Yeah, that makes sense. So I don't know, maybe you can touch hmm. your thoughts on why they would crave, yeah. you know, power. Well, it's, it's Yeah, it's, it's something I've thought a lot about. And I guess one of the problems for me is like, I don't know if they're using like the stock version or not. Yeah. Um, y- y'all know that, but I like, <laughs> I don't research it and I don't know it. Um, so like Rajiv Ram, I think has the pure arrow, but I don't know if it's like the stock pure arrow or not. Yeah. Um, and then I was watching a, uh, Wesley Kuhlhoff and uh, Neil Skubsky, who have had a really good year this year, and they both use some version of the Prestige, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Bruno Suarez is using, it looks like, the Pro Staff. Yeah. Um, so you've got the Prestige and Pro Staff that I would think be more like traditional, like you're saying, for doubles. Like, I love volleying with those rackets. So, like, you know, that's what I would think if I was a pro doubles player, I would want. But when I volley, uh, with the pure arrow, I feel like I lose all control. But I play like once or twice a week, not <laughs> seven days a week. So yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so yeah, those are definitely some examples of the ones using the traditional frames. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was mm-hmm. thinking guys like Rajiv Ram, um, mm-hmm. who else? Uh, the Bryans forever have used pure drive, pure drive type of yeah. rackets, whether yeah. they were the Wilson right. versions or like the N Pro to pure drive to now blackout Salenko rackets, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or. Um, Bethany Maddox says. That's how I was going to talk about uh, that. Yeah. She's, she's switched between Babylon rackets, but like the one that we tested was the Pure Arrow. Mm-hmm. And she mm-hmm. strung it with the natural gut hybrid at really low tension. And it was like from the baseline, it was like, man, how do you control this? But like on the volleys, it was just like deadly power. Like the ball just shoots off. And it's like, yeah, I could kind of see that mid range game kind of like, you know, mid court to closing out the net. That easy power is great from the baseline maybe mm-hmm. a little harder to control mm-hmm. but you know those the, the world class doubles players are, a lot of them are just trying to crash the net yeah. you know or trying to get in as soon as possible yeah so maybe that's kind of why they want that easy power but there's yeah. still there's still quite a few that like you made points of that are using you know some more classic control frames for sure yeah it's interesting yeah. i'd be interested to talk to some of them about it um like philip Polasek is another one like he uses uh, the extreme i think yeah and he's like, he's huge, and he has ton, like he's one of the strongest people on tour. It's like, why does he need more like power? But, yeah, uh, Michael I, I Venus, know. Michael Venus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Also, Marcelo Mello was using Arrow for the longest time. Now uses Extreme. Mm-hmm. So definitely yeah. more examples of that. Yeah, like, interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Sometimes I feel like with the guys too. I don't know. Okay, actually, I'm going to rephrase this. So I think a lot of the players on the women's side who actually have come up through college are using similar rackets to what they had used in college. And as someone Mm -hmm. that like you play with your college racket and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is like I need this. I need this for my rest the rest of my life. Like and we've even seen Juju. She said she played uh, with a pure drive in college. That's what she plays with now. And I wonder if that's part of it. And like on the men's side, they can be a little more gearhead, geeked out. Also, it depends on where you're coming from. I feel like a lot of these doubles mm. players, like everyone in Europe, kind of grows up with head rackets, prestige, those ones. And some of them are a little older, not gonna lie. <laughs> some on the men's tour <laughs> are aging out yeah. there. Um, so that's where I'm coming with perspective. I don't know. I might be full of it though. <laughs> yeah, that's a good theory. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Well, to wrap this one up, who is on your list of players that we should be watching? Who should we take note of? If someone listening's never even taken the time to watch a pro doubles match, who is someone that they should definitely put on their list and make a point of watching this year? So the team I just mentioned, uh, Kuhlhoff and Skupski have had a good year. I, I think they just lost first round in Monte Carlo, unfortunately. Mm. But um, <laughs> other than that, they've had a really good year. Uh so I've been watching them a good bit. The um, new number one men's player is Joe Salisbury, mm-hmm. and he is he is a blast to watch. He um, plays he uh, so athletic. He, played, he does. Yeah. yeah, he uses a Technofiber. 
and he he is so athletic and you'll like i mean you'll see points it's only like one or two per match because the um the rally links are typically so short but i mean you'll see these points where the the ball is totally put away but if he has room to run up into the stands to the 10th <laughs> row to get it he's gonna get it and he'll hit like a winner off of it um so he's he's a lot of fun to watch he and Rajiv ram uh and then on the women's side um Makoko is great. Yeah. Uh, they've been great for doubles. Um, I really hope that Coco keeps playing. Um, I think she just cracked the top 10 in doubles, um, which is awesome. So, you know, a lot of people have wondered the past few years, you know, where does doubles go after the Bryan brothers? Makoko is definitely um, a good American duo that can kind of keep doubles afloat. Mm-hmm. And at Indian Wells, I mean, you couldn't get a seat for their, any of their matches. So they're a lot of fun to watch. Um, uh, Krejcikova and Siniakova are, are the best. Um, they, <laughs> Siniakova, I think, is the best doubles player in the world. Um, she is watching her move at the net. Um, is you can learn a lot uh, watching her move at the net. She's she's constantly reading the opponents, figuring out when to poach. She'll poach on one. She'll fake on the next one, um, and just kind of causing controlled chaos up there. So yeah, those are some of the players that that I like to watch. Uh, and then I'd encourage um, any club level players to watch, uh, but there's a ton. I mean, yeah, it, it's all a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. And I know everyone's excited. Like tennis is back full swing for 2022. So it's, we have a lot of tennis to watch and it's still early in the year. There's going to be the whole U.S. Open series. So if you are in the United States and you live close to any of these tournaments, I would, I was just telling Troy today, I'm like, next year we're going to Monte Carlo. Like, like let's yeah, just get tickets and go. <laughs> Because uh, just like seeing it on TV and like, oh, yeah. I missed out on BMP this year. So I'm a little sad and I really need to get out there or somewhere. <laughs> get uh, your tennis fix. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to ask Troy a question and Will the same question, but in different regards. So Troy, for anyone out there listening, what's a way that someone can just like up their gear and maybe make it better for them for their doubles game? That's a good. That's a good question. There's a couple things, you know. Um, one, since I play with one, and me and Booney mm-hmm. testers are always talking about them. If you haven't demoed before ever an extended length racket, mm-hmm. maybe give it a try. Um, probably my favorites on the market right now are the Yonixes. Yeah, both the 98s, the E Zone, and the V Core. Really fun. Um, Pure Drive Plus is really fun. Aero Plus. So if you use one of those rackets already, or if you haven't tried an extended, just give it a shot, yeah. you know, and maybe just demo one, see yeah. how it works for your game, see if you can maybe adapt it on your serve and choke up at the net, kind of like what <laughs> yeah. I was talking about. So I think mm-hmm. that's one thing. And then also that we all, I've always talked about on a lot of different podcasts, being sort of a racket nerd, but maybe try customizing your racket, mm-hmm. especially for doubles players that are, you know, at least we're a lot of the pros and you know recreational players were trying to to get to the net and hit more volleys or hit those like half court shots where the you really need the racket to be stable because you're not taking a full swing um maybe try we have a lot of information on our website that Mm -hmm. you can look up in videos on how to customize but maybe put a couple grams of lead tape at the three and nine o'clock on your racket and just see how that really affects the stabilizing of the racket and how it really can make your volleys feel more solid. Yeah. You know, if that's too head heavy, you can always add weight yeah. to the handle, but a little bit of customization I think can go a long way, especially for those that are really like hitting a lot of volleys. So Nice. Easy. And Will, what's an easy tip that someone listening can take onto the doubles court this week? Yeah, um so I want to get to that, but also what he just said about the stabilization I, I think is huge. Um one thing that people ask me a lot is like how to and I just did a podcast episode on this like how do you transition from uh, three five to four oh from four oh to four five you know how do I improve and as the game gets faster uh, especially you know three five all the way up to four five and five oh you need a more stable racket especially if you're getting to the net on those volleys so um, his tips there to to help create a more stable racket uh, if you're starting to play a faster paced game I think can go a long way because I, you know, I'm testing rackets all the time as well. And when I'm playing with the MPs uh, that are a little bit lighter, I I can't volley. Like it's, (laughs) I feel like I have no control, Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm playing five O tennis. So, you know, it's different. So at three, five, that's totally fine. But as you kind of progress, that stabilization is big, but to answer your question, uh, 
what tips can people use to uh, to improve their doubles game? It depends on which area you're struggling with. For I mean, I can go on and on about this. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a whole website on it, right? Um, high percentage of first serves, uh, own the middle of the court, don't cover the double sally. Um, I, I'd say the big thing to focus on in doubles or the big mistake I see a lot of club level players make is they try to win the point from the baseline mm -hmm. um, and they just try to hit too many winners. Uh, most points end in an error. So rather than thinking about how can I hit more winners, how can I play better? Uh, how can you make your opponent play worse? How can you force more errors? So that could be net movement and you don't even hit the ball. Uh, it could be trying to set your partner up at the net so that they can hit an easy volley at the opponent's feet. So think about how to attack the opponent's weaknesses more than hitting more winners for yourself. Nice. I love that. That's a good good point. Well, tell our listeners how they can catch up with even more Doubles Drills on your website and where you, they can listen to your podcast. Yeah, so uh, the website is thetennistribe.com. Uh, and the podcast is called the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast. Um, so I do episodes uh, every two weeks when I'm uh, disciplined about it. I'm, I'm trying to start doing one every week. Uh, and then I also have a newsletter. So um, every Thursday I do a new strategy lesson. Um, so people can sign up for that on the website as well. Uh, and then the Watch More Doubles t-shirts are for sale there as well. Awesome. Um, all the proceeds for that go towards... Uh, supporting pro doubles players. Um, so uh, yeah, we're trying to really make it more popular. I love that. And I didn't even ask you, what's your current racket of choice? Uh, so I use the Speed Pro. Nice. Have you yeah. hit, is, did you switch to the new one yet? The 2022? Uh, so I <laughs> tested it in Indian Wells. So I went out with uh, Ali and uh, the rest of the team to the um, the boom event and they had some speed pros there. Nice. Um, so I tried out the boom pro and the speed pro and I loved them both. <laughs> yep. That sounds, you're right in line with us. We love both those rackets. And I know a couple, <laughs> Troy's been using the boom pro a lot. Booney's been using the boom pro a lot. And then Chris Edwards just switched to the speed pro. So you're in good company. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people like it. Those new speeds and like we were I was talking about earlier, it's it's a really great uh, kind of middle of the middle of the road as far as like not too much power, but not so hard to use like a classic player frame. Yeah. Nice, nice right. frames. Yeah. Yeah. Good balance. Awesome. Well, I feel like we could definitely do more collaborations. I, I like I'm envisioning like <laughs> Troy, like giving you a racket setup and then you going to test it on a doubles match. <laughs> and then like we come back and discuss, but <laughs> something like that would be super fun. But we, we appreciate you taking the time and joining us on Talk Tennis and talking all about doubles. And we'll have to do a part two uh, coming up or maybe after the French Open and Wimbledon and kind of check back in with the Watch More Doubles campaign and everything in pro doubles and relate it back to all of our listeners playing out there. So thanks for joining us and happy hitting. Absolutely. Thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun.